Funding for Encuentros is provided in part by the Reinhardt Foundation, Self-Sustainability for the Poor. Hello, welcome to Encuentros from the Institute of the Americas in La Jolla, California. My name is Jeffrey Davidow. Our guest is Dr. Enrique Garcia, president of the Andean Development Corporation. Dr. Garcia is a leading economist in Latin America. He's headed his particular organization for 17 years. Prior to that, he was treasurer of the Inter-American Development Bank and is one of the leaders in promoting development on the continent, in Latin America generally, all in, although the Andean Development uh, uh, Corporation has the name of the Andes in it, it now has 17 Latin American countries uh, from Central America down to Chile and Argentina as members. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Thank you. What's happening in Latin American economies? We, we read that things are going well, that GDP is increasing, yet we all know that there's uh, tremendous poverty in many countries. Um, how should we as Americans interpret what's happening down there? Well, certainly the, the last five years have been, in my opinion, the best uh, Latin America has had in the last 30 years. In terms of, of growth, uh, the rate of growth uh, has been, in the last five years, the average uh, close to 5%, 4.6, in, in the Andean region about 5%, uh, low inflation in most of the countries, uh, balanced budgets, uh, uh, I would say superb uh, export performance, and in fact, because of that, uh, Latin America has uh, now very high uh, level of international reserves, uh, surplus in, in current account, uh, which is not common. Uh, that's the, the good part of the story, but, but of course, uh, most of this uh, positive outlook uh, is tied up, uh, in my opinion, to also a very strong world economy in the last five years, with the exception of the last few months, uh, taking into account what's happening here in the United States and the impact in the rest of the world. But before that, uh, you had a very strong uh, world economy. Uh, you had uh, simultaneously the US, uh, Europe, and especially uh, Asia, and particularly, more specifically, India and, and, and China, playing a, a, a very, very important role uh, with a great impact for Latin America because especially in South America uh, commodity-based economies have had the benefit of high export prices and the terms of trade have, uh, have improved considerably and this explains to a greater degree what has happened on the macro side. But uh, on the macroeconomic side, which is I would say essential for self-sustained growth, uh, the region is not doing that well. And specific issues, uh, I think uh, logistics and infrastructure are lagging. Uh, I think the education and technology are not updated to the requirements of this millennium. Uh, it's still financial sectors are not deep enough to to provide the uh, good services to the majority of the people, and institutions still have weaknesses, and that's very important, as you know, to attract investment in, in a region. And the third thing, which is perhaps the most important one, is that still Latin America, notwithstanding the fact that in the last few years, has improved the the indicators of, of, of poverty, in other words, reducing poverty. But still in Latin America, one out of every three Latin Americans live, lives with less than $2 a day. And income distribution is, is one of, is the worst in the, in the world. So taking in account these elements, I think that it's very positive what has happened in terms of the macro environment. I think that movements in the positive direction in the other fields, but not sufficient. And the message we always give is that Latin America should take this uh, particular good boom situation as a window of opportunity, as a platform to make the necessary reforms in the public and private sectors so that you can create an environment of, for growth, but good quality growth. Good quality growth is, it means that there will, won't be so much concentration in a few exports uh, to try to give more value added to natural resources and com commodities that we have now. 
in move from comparative advantage to competitive advantage through technology, cluster development, things of that nature, and of course have an inclusive policy where the majority of citizens will participate in the benefits of growth. Traditionally, when there's a recession in the United States, the economies of Latin America suffer. Uh, Mexico usually more than, let's say, Argentina. Do you think this new macroeconomic strength that you've talked about will allow those economies to withstand or at least perform better in a recession uh, in the United States than they have, have historically been able to do? Yes, definitely I would say the, the answer is positive. And the reason is, as I explained before, the, the macro environment, the indicators uh, show strength. For, for instance, uh, the level of international reserves of, of Latin America today, uh, over $400 billion, uh, makes it possible to defend the region from uh, external shocks for a while. Of course, depends how deep a recession is. Uh, if, as I hope, uh, what is happening in the U.S. will be more of a short-term recession, not a long-term one, then in that case, I think Latin America is much better prepared now than what when it, what it was about 10 years ago. And of course, there is also a difference between uh, different regions. I think that uh, for Mexico and Central America, going up to pa down to Panama, the impact uh, will be greater than for South America. But uh, we are much better prepared uh, the, not to have a, 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 a big crisis in the region. The Latin American economies that you described are uh, of course, there's been very significant progress, but in some ways it's distressing because they resemble the Latin American economies of the 19th century in the, ter in, in the sense that they're very heavily dependent on export of natural resources. Now it's not so much, let's say, bananas or coffee, but it's soybean or, or copper. Uh, how does a country move from being a predominant exporter of natural resources to a, a country that is able to take those natural resources, do something with them, and then add value to the exports. I know you mentioned that, but what have other countries done that have been successful that Latin America is not doing? Well, the first thing is, of course, to recognize the issue. And to recognize the issue means that the cycles are cycles. And these booms in, in, in commodity prices uh, can last uh, three years, five years, ten years, but sometime they will go down. Once you recognize that, then I believe the, a country or a region uh, will start having an agenda, a long-term agenda, which precisely will, will make the transformation of the economy, the transi transition from comparative advantage to competitive advantage. And that implies, of course, uh, many things. Uh, one is to, uh, to, to improve uh, productivity, to improve the quality of, of human resources, uh, education, technology, to discover uh, uh, new fields, uh, to organize clusters in which you are going to combine uh, weaknesses in, 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 in all the, the sound aspects of, of groups, to be able to compete internationally, and definitely to use natural resources in a way that you will go to, to, to higher stages of, of, of production with, with given value added. There are examples in the world. If, if who remembers that uh, Finland, for instance, uh, was essentially built their strength on the basis of natural resources. Today, everybody thinks about uh, Nokia or things like that. Uh, so Latin America has to, to, to move step by step in this way. It's not an easy task, because, uh, of course, when you are used to have uh, income coming very easily when you have the, these uh, export prices, but I, I think it's a question of getting all society, governments, private sector, universities, working together in, in developing activities that will be uh, less vulnerable to external shocks. You mentioned before that the poverty in Latin America remains an endemic problem. There has been progress. The number of people, let's say, living on less than one dollar a day, the abject poverty, has actually gone down fairly decently in the last five to ten years. But as you pointed out, one in three Latin Americans are still living on less than two dollars a day, living below the poverty line. What works in a society, or what has worked in some Latin American countries, 
to enable people to move out of poverty into lives of, of greater economic dignity. How does that happen? Well, I think the, the first element is that you have to relate poverty alleviation reduction to growth. Unless you have sustainable growth, high rates of growth, you are not going to, to fight poverty. But not any type of growth. I call good quality growth. And good quality growth implies that's not only efficient in economic terms, but that will create employment, I think, productive employment. And once you get pr productive employment, that's a very important factor to get people in, in, in the economic realities of, uh, of, 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 of a country. The other thing, of course, is education. If you start with a good uh, educational program that starts with the, with the a child, because the first five, six years in, in, in life are basic. If you don't have good, good education at that level, what's going to happen is that you automatically are giving these people, they have a handicap. They don't have, they are below everybody. So education, technology, uh, and activities that will be uh, creators of employment. And of course, good po government policy. Uh, I think it's very dangerous if you try to, to fight poverty just by subsidies uh, without having at the same time an economy that will be sound. So I think that and we try to, to, to promote that from, uh, from my institution is to a, a model in which you will reconcile three things. Reconcile stability objectives, efficiency objectives and equity objectives. Uh, those three things are, are crucial because without macroeconomic stability you cannot have sustained growth. Without sustained growth you cannot fight poverty. If you fight poverty without growth, sooner or later you are going to have a, a macroeconomic uh, uh, disaster and then you'll have to adjust your economy and an adjustment process, uh, the typical things that we used to do in Latin America, implies that you will have two or three years of negative growth, then no employment, more informality, more poverty. So it's a question of, of realism and, and I think that the governments have to understand that the solutions are not only an issue that is the responsibility of the government. It's a responsibility of government, the private sector, labor unions, so civil society. I mean, let's talk about equity for a minute because it does appear as Latin American economies grow, uh, they either become more unequal or the level of inequity is not really changed very much, meaning the poor stay poor and the rich get richer. Now that's an overstatement and I, uh, oversimplification, I realize that. But what kind of government policies can ensure greater equity in the short to medium term? Obviously education in the long term by preparing people to, to enter better jobs is, is, is probably the most significant factor. But f in five years or ten years, how do you change government policy to allow for greater equity? Well, first of all, I think poverty alleviation is easier and very successful uh, policies in some of the countries with the growth have shown that. For instance, uh, Chile has shown that with the, the type of policies they have managed in the last uh, uh, 20 years, they were able to, to diminish substantially the poverty. But it's not that easy to change the, 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 the equation of equity of, uh, of, of the income distribution. But is it important? If you can, if you can reduce poverty, you should does, it ma poverty. does it matter if the rich get richer? No, I think... Uh, I think you, you, you should get a, a better distribution of, of the benefits of growth. I think in the case of Latin America, it goes to an extreme. It's very difficult not to have rich people. There's nothing wrong to have rich people. But what you want to have is a, a, a middle class, a, a solid middle class, which is an, a very important component also in, in politics because you, democracy is based on, 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 on solid middle classes. And so how do you do that? Uh, well, first of all, education, it's a very fundamental element uh, for equity. Secondly, it's property, uh, land tenure, very important. There are delicate issues, issues that uh, politically are, are very touchy. Access to 
to financial services, for instance, uh, uh, for the for people in the lower lower lower, lower branches, and definitely a good. Uh, uh, fiscal policy in the sense of, of having the right type of combination of taxes and, and subsidies with, a, with economic principles. That's, that's essential. Uh, I think a, a progressive taxing is very important. Uh, Value-added taxes, which are used in Latin America very efficiently for, for getting in, uh, tax revenue, but unfortunately it's regressive. You have to to move to, a, unfortunately for people who are in the upper brackets, but you have to have a more progressive uh, rating tax uh, for, for, for families. So you combine all these elements and you can improve, eliminate you know, the fact that uh, they are poor and they are rich and, and, and less rich people, that's very difficult. But what you have in Latin America is very, very, uh, it goes to an extreme. You don't have that in, even in Africa and nowhere else. The uh, relationship that you mentioned between poverty and, de and democracy, or, or put it another way, poverty and the threat to democracy, seems to be an important factor that we are aware of in this country as we read about Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, other nations in Latin America. Are, what can we expect from governments like that of Hugo Chavez or Evo Morales in Bolivia uh, over the next uh, foreseeable future, three to five years? Yeah, well, let, let's see. Uh, perhaps let, let me move to, to Bolivia since it's my country. It's easier. And Caracas is my headquarters, so I'll prefer to talk about my country. Uh, Definitely, uh, what the Morales uh, 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 situation. Morales is a man who comes from, you know, the low class, uh, poor people, not with great uh, level of education, not education at all, but with leadership. And he has been elected democratically in Bolivia with a, a solid majority. There are things, of course, in the short run that probably are not. Uh, as uh, satisfactory from the economic standpoint. But if you ask me a question as Bolivian, uh, is Bolivia going to be better or worse off uh, 20 years from now because what is going on in Bolivia with Morales? I think we'll be better off in the long term, in the medium term. Now in the short term, what is very important is that a government like Morales uh, should realize that what I said before, that unless you have sound economic policies to, to for growth, and that's impossible to to accelerate a process of reduction of poverty and on inclusion. You can do it for a while if you have a a surplus in, in your in, 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 in your finances because of the cycle. But unless you move for, uh, to a, a policy that will encourage more investment, investment in areas where the country has a potential, what will happen is that maybe three years, four years from now you will not have the possibility to, to sustain a rate of growth and considerably uh, elements, uh, elements of poverty cannot be eliminated. The case of Venezuela well, is similar in the sense that uh, Venezuela, of course, if you look at the, the figures, and then you can discuss that, but definitely the, the poverty indices are, have improved. That's a, it's a fact. But the question is, what happened in Venezuela when the price of oil, for instance, if something happens, a shock in the, in the world, instead of 90 or whatever, in, in, at the, at the, 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 the price goes to 70, to 60, well, there would be a problem, definitely. And the question is, is possible to sustain the, the, the social programs that uh, have been successful, in, indeed, in, in many aspects? Well, I think I have my doubts. So again, the most important thing is that politicians all over the region should realize that you have to combine sound policies at the macro level, at the micro level, then ensure growth and investment is crucial. And that important factor is that investment to, to have an impact on growth has to be of higher, a higher level of investment. Latin America is investing only 22% of GDP. It should be investing at least 28, 29%. And it does not have enough resources within the region. Even in this macroeconomic environment, so good, the savings ratio is basically the same as the investment, 22%. So you need to invest 28%, you need at least 5% of additional savings coming from the rest of the world. 
Over the next 10 years, how much? No, you well, well, I'm talking 5% in, in net terms, you're talking about $150 billion or to $200 billion a year. So over the next five years or so? No, you need $1 billion. Oh, one trillion dollars. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And trillion. so, so Latin America will be, from your perspective, heavily dependent on foreign investment. Absolutely. All of this means that the rules for foreign investment That's a for level. both sides, the receiving country and the investor, have to be clear and transparent and fair. You How do you guarantee that? You're absolutely right. I think that sometimes in the region there is a misunderstanding about the importance of, of foreign investment. But if you are very pragmatic, giving you the figures I gave you, you can talk to any government, right or left, and you ask them, they say, look, you need 5% of GDP of foreign investment. It has to be either capital markets or, or, or IDBs or World Banks, but mainly direct investment. So to do that, the, 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 to establish the institutional framework that will be uh, ensure rules of the game that will be attractive for foreign investment are crucial. I was talking to the Chinese, and, and, and why, you ask uh, the Chinese, why do they want uh, foreign investment, the Chinese, when they have a surplus uh, savings of 40%? Well, it's not only the issue of, of money. Uh, it, direct investment brings technology, brings markets, brings management. And precisely the, this high-level uh, official in the Chinese government was telling me that, that the Chinese have recognized the importance of that, uh, foreign investment. And that's why China is the main recipient of, of foreign investment. And Latin America has to do that. If you, we want to, 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 to develop, uh, even to go, give value added to, to commodities we have now, uh, even gas and oil and those things, uh, you, you need billions of dollars of investment and if you want to 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 insert yourself in the in the competitive world today to make a, to compete in Europe in Asia so forth it's a great effort and that's why I think rules of the game stable rules of the game in the long term recognizing the differences because there's one element not all countries are, are thinking the same in Latin America today. Uh, in, in one specific issue, the issue of the role of the government and the role of the private sector. But one has not to be dogmatic. In our case, for instance, we say it's a, in, a, in a state enterprise. If it's run by market principles, okay, I'll give examples. You have Petro, uh, Petrobras in Brazil. Petrobras essentially is a public uh, corporation, but placed by the rules of the game of the market. In fact, it has uh, 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 ADRs in, in, in the stock market in, in New York, uh, it borrows in the international capital markets, it has professional management, it has joint ventures with the private sector and works very well. There are other oil companies in, in the region which don't work the same well. And so it's a question of, of being conscious of the of the of the role of competitiveness and efficiency in in, in running things. Well, you've talked about investment, but obviously, what makes the world go around is trade, and uh, the United States has, in recent years, developed free trade agreements with Mexico, NAFTA, Central America, recently with Peru. Um, there is a big debate going on in, in the American Congress now about whether we should have a free trade agreement with Colombia. Is that important for us? Is it important for Colombia? No, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, free trade, trade is the other component. We have discussed before investment. Investment and trade, they are two fundamental uh, instruments uh, to, for, to, to strengthen the relationship at, at the world, a global level, and of course, are, are good for the countries, for both sides. So, uh, to encourage the, the, the closing of these uh, the, uh, trade agreements in, in Latin America, that's a very positive thing. We are very pleased to see that uh, Peru got the, the, the approval, and we really hope that uh, Colombia will do, the uh, Congress will approve, because that, uh, it's it's good for Colombia, it's good for the United States, it's good from the economic side, uh, standpoint, it's good from the political standpoint. And in addition to that, I think that uh, we have to revise a little bit uh, all the hemispheric relations for, for the future. I'm, I'm counting that in the summit of the Americas that will take place in 2009. I think in, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, the, the, the hemisphere uh, is able to 
uh, reestablish an agenda because unfortunately uh, the protectionist uh, uh, attitude in Latin America and here in the United States are 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 very strong nowadays but with the protectionist you don't get anywhere so uh, I hope that in 2009 uh, besides trade and investment you have other things uh, things that are crucial that in Europe worked out very well how richer countries can provide resources to improve the level of the economy of smaller countries what the German and the, the French did in Europe to upgrade the economic uh, situation of Spain, of Portugal, Italy, so forth, that's a very important element. And, and to, to, to finance infrastructure, to get the, the resources to create precisely what I said before, uh, the concept of a middle class. Middle class not only in terms of, of persons, but middle class in terms of nations. You talk about the, the social cohesion funds and the transfer of money from rich countries uh, in the north of Europe to the south of Europe, uh, which has helped Spain and Portugal and what have you. We only have about a minute left. How do you make that argument to the wealthy countries of this hemisphere, which are essentially Canada and the United States, that it's in their interest to transfer resources to the south? It has to be a very comprehensive uh, approach because the interest groups look essentially at the things. Labor uh, unions don't like free trade because, of course, they, they, that conspires against their, their, their jobs. Uh, others don't like immigration. And they, they, the developing countries think that, uh, that it's impossible for them to compete. And here in the, in the rich countries, I think uh, you have to put a, a, the arguments in a, in a broader context including the geopolitical thing. I think it's very, very important to show the, 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 the importance of good hemispheric relationships, to take into account what is going on in the world, to look at the experiences that the, the United States has had in other parts of the world, what happened in, 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 in the, in the, with terrorists, with things like that. And, and I think Latin America and the United States and Canada in the hemisphere, be, be, being neighbors, uh, the priority should be to establish a good, good relationship in this uh, hemisphere. And unfortunately, we see that uh, the Latin America in recent years has not occupied a highly prioritized uh, uh, stand in, in, in U.S. Uh, relation. It's understandable. You had problems here that uh, what happened 9-11 and uh, Iraq and this and that. But Nonetheless, uh, there's a little bit of frustration in Latin America because uh, we felt that in the 90s, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Latin America was very strong. And that's why the, the, the summit of the Americas at the beginning were very successful. But now I'm concerned and I hope that, uh, well, the next president of the United States, whoever it is, will reestablish the dialogue, uh, that dialogue in a, in a more comprehensive way. Well, with that very hopeful thought, We've brought this conversation to an end. Our guest has been Dr. Enrique Garcia, president of the Andean Development Corporation. This has been Encuentros. Thank you.